Hi guys, I uh, hope you're all keeping safe and well. I just thought I would do another short little PowerPoint video uh, around the different theories of learning just to complement and go alongside some of the work that you're, you're doing on EverLearner uh, and some of the videos on there. Just this is my PowerPoint which tries to summarise some of the key points there on these theories of learning which is a key area. So the aims of this lesson or this short video is to look specifically at the different um, theories around learning. So as it says, by the end of this section, you should be able to demonstrate and apply knowledge and understanding of the following learning theories. Operant conditioning, um, and within that we've got Thorndike's laws, the cognitive theories of learning, and then finally social learning or observational learning theory um, by Bandura, which we, we've talked about in different areas a lot, so hopefully that one's quite familiar to you. So a little starter task, um, I'd like you to try and pause the PowerPoint and have a go at this starter task once we've gone through it. As it mentions, the way in which we learn movements and skills, particularly in a sporting context, is very diverse and very individual. We all have different learning styles and learning methods. There are three theories that we will explore in this section that explain some of the ways in which we do this. Learning will realistically take place using a range of these theories rather than just one in isolation. So a bit of a continuum like we've talked about in different areas, but you may have a predominant learning method that you will use. And the three learning methods, uh, which hopefully are familiar to you from the work you're doing with learner, we've got operant conditioning, which is learning using trial and error, and then conditioning the most effective response through practice. We've got the cognitive theory of learning, which is learning by doing the whole skill and using problem solving to work out uh, therefore how to most effectively perform the skill. And finally, social learning or observational learning, which is learning through watching and copying others. Now in this example below, uh, we've got all three of these learning methods taking place. What I want you to do, as it says, Imagine you are teaching a year seven student how to do an instep pass in football. That's a side foot pass, just a short pass over a short distance. You could first use a demonstration and the student has to copy you. You then ask them to practice the passing through a variety of cones and you could put the student into a small sided game of 2v2 where they have to make five passes to score. So in that example, can you identify where each of these um, different theories, learning theories have been applied? You can pause this and have a go at that. OK, so hopefully you have paused it and you've had a go. Um, and hopefully you came up with something along the similar lines. So the first part, the demonstration. Demonstration is an example of the social learning, of the observational learning. So learning through watching and copying others. Um, then when they start to use the cones, that's an example of operant conditioning. And then finally, uh, into the small sided game, the 2v2, that's using the cognitive theory of learning, where they're having to put the skill that they've been working on into practice and work out how to do it most effectively. So all three methods of learning are being used in that example. So we're going to look at each of these um, learning methods in isolation. The first one we'll look at is operant conditioning. I'm going to try not put too much detail in here because hopefully you've got some detailed notes from the work we've already been doing. So, in 1964, Skinner used a box with a rat inside it to work out this operant conditioned learning. If the rat hit a lever inside the box, a food pellet would be released. Um, through trial and error, the rat eventually learned that hitting the lever would produce food. Those of you doing uh, psychology, I think you'll look at this as well. This became known as operant conditioning. Hitting the lever gave food, and therefore the reward, which reinforced the hitting action, so it's reinforcing their learning. Conditioning of this type will only take place if there is some sort of reinforcement, which in this case was the food for the rat. Um, another example of operant conditioning is a parent who gives a child a sweet to stop it crying. Unfortunately, this reinforces the behaviour, and then for, the child might cry to get another sweet, so perhaps... Not a great example. Operant conditioning is a method of learning by association or connection. It's therefore known as an associationist or connectionist theory. 
So you've probably heard that term or seen that term in the notes we've already taken. Uh, it's also known as trial and error learning. So in that first example, the rat worked out if he hit this lever, then he got his food, a little trial and error. Okay, so another summary of operant conditioning. As it says, an associationist or connectionist view of learning, which focus on manipulating and conditioning behavior towards a stimulus using trial and error. In a sporting context, we've got an example here, a badminton player learns to smash, so that's the response, when they see the shuttlecock nice and high near the net, so the automatic says, right, I need to win my point, I'm gonna gain that by smashing. Okay, so that's the stimuli, so the response, there it is, nice and high, easy, I can easily win a point here, and then the stimuli, I'm gonna smash that to win my point. And then that situation is practiced and reinforced by the coach or by the fact that they, they gain a point or they win a point. So the stimulus response, the SR bond, the stimulus response bond is focused on in this theory. Two key terms when we look at operant conditioning, which again, hopefully are not alien to you, you've seen in the previous work. Reinforcement, uh, which is used to strengthen the stimulus response bond and therefore increases the likelihood that the behavior will occur in the same way. So we're only gonna repeat something if that's reinforced, and that might be through praise, or a way of knowing that was the right thing to do. And then Thorndike's laws. Uh, and these laws were developed to help strengthen the stimulus response bond when using operant conditioning as a learning method. And we're gonna look at those in a little bit more detail. So, positive reinforcement. Uh, we've looked at this term in, in different areas. This is when a stimulus is given after the correct response usually in the form of praise or a reward. A punishment is when a stimulus is given to prevent a response occurring, such as a forfeit or something else unpleasant. We do something that prevents them from doing that again. Uh, a detention is meant to be a punishment to prevent you doing something again. And then negative reinforcement. This is when an unpleasant or adverse stimulus is withdrawn after the correct response. For example, the coach will stop shouting at the performer uh, if they're doing something right. I think, right, at least I'm doing that right, I'm gonna stop getting shouted at now. What I would like you to do, a little mini task again, can you identify which type of reinforcement is being applied in these three practical examples? So is it positive reinforcement, is it punishment, or is it negative reinforcement? And we've got three, oh, sorry, four different examples there. Um, a basketball player's coach made him do sprints for every bad pass, and when they made a successful pass, he doesn't have to run sprints anymore. A coach giving a sweep to a tennis player when their serve lands in. A coach stops shouting instructions at the player when they make a successful cross. And a coach praising a footballer for making a successful cross. So we've got four sporting examples. What I'd like to do again is pause the video and see which of those four examples, which type of reinforcement is positive reinforcement, punishment, or negative reinforcement is being used in each of those four cases. So if you can pause this and have a go, and then we'll look at the answers on the next slide. So hopefully you've had a go, um, and you've come up with something similar to the following. First one, a basketball player's coach made him do sprints for every bad pass, and when they made a successful pass, he doesn't have to run sprints anymore. That is a form of punishment. Hopefully you came up with that. A coach giving a sweep to a tennis player when their serve lands in. An example of positive reinforcement. A coach stops shouting instructions at the player when they make a successful cross. An example of negative reinforcement. And a coach praising a footballer for making a successful cross. Sorry, positive reinforcement. So final bit around operant conditioning. Uh, in order for the SR, the stimulus response bond, to be strengthened, the player must be physically and mentally ready to learn the skill, must like performing the skill, and must practice the skill to perfect it. And we've got Thorndike's laws here, which come into play. So we've got the law of exercise, the law of effect, and the law of readiness. What I would like you to do... Um, Little mini task link at least one practical example to each of the three laws, and there's an example of a basketball free throw shot below. 
So we've got the law of exercise. If the player practices for 20 minutes daily, they are more likely to improve and strengthen the SR bond. The law of effect, if they start scoring a free throw shot, they will gain more confidence and satisfaction, so we'll continue to practice. And the law of readiness, they must be physically strong enough to throw a basketball to get a three throw and want to improve this. If they can't physically do it, they're not, they're not going to be able to, and these four Lux laws won't come into play. So can you try, um, we've got a basketball example here, can you pause the, the video and can you try and choose a different practical example and put the three laws of practice into play, please? Thank you. Okay, so the next theory we're going to look at, and I say we're rushing through this briefly because it's just to support the work we've already done, is the cognitive theory of learning. Um, and this isn't to be confused with the cognitive stage of learning. When we look at cognitive, associative and autonomous, there's different, three different stages of learning which we're going to move on to. This is about the cognitive theory of learning. Uh, and this is a view where the skill should be learned in its entirety using whole practice. When we looked at practice methods previously, we looked at whole practice and part practice, and whole part whole. This is uh, dealing specifically with whole practice. So, can you recap the characteristics of the cognitive stage of learning? So the first stage of learning, we've just touched upon this. We haven't done a great deal of work on this, um, so don't worry too much about it. But remember that this is the stage of learning rather than how we might learn a physical skill. And just have a little recap in your mind or in your notes what whole practice is and the types of skills that we would use whole practice for. So are they going to be low organisation, high organisation? Are they going to have a lot of subroutines? Are they going to be self-paced, externally paced? All those different classifications of skills. So just recap on some of your notes on those areas to help you with this cognitive theory of learning. As it says, this theory encourages thinking and problem solving to gain understanding and ability, rather than the trial and error from the first theory looked at from that operant conditioning. And two key concepts when examining this theory of learning. First, insight learning. This is using, using problem solving and using memory of effective experiences to solve a new challenge. Put it into a sporting context. For example, a coach explains why a badminton player should return a serve using an overhead clear. And the performer starts to develop an insight on the understanding of why they're doing it. They're not just doing it for the response. They're thinking of the actual reason behind it. An insight. Why am I learning this? Though? How is this going to help me? Second one, intervening variables. So these are the mental processes involved in decision making. Uh, and we've got an example there. A coach could encourage the badminton player to think about the height of the serve and where the player is stood before deciding where to place the clear. So again, to think about what they're actually doing and the impacts this is going to have. If they put it to a certain area, is it going to make it easier or harder for their opponent to return that shot? So, little task again, pause the video. Can you think of other examples from sport to show insight learning and intervening variables? Use the examples below and just choose a different sport, maybe your sport, and try and think of some insight learning and intervening variables. So, moving on, this theory is thought to develop a player's ability to read a game more effectively, rather than simply carrying out practice response to a certain stimuli, it's giving you a more in-depth and reasoning behind why you are doing certain things. Advantages? Former can become more independent and self-correct during a game, not just relying on the coach. They're aware of different situations and different things that might happen and can correct this. Uh, they can adapt better to different situations because they're practicing and learning in lots of different situations. They can make quick progress. That kinesthesis, that, that feeling that we get, we've talked about kinesthetics before, and that feeling of, of performing and doing it right, which can be developed. Some disadvantages. Using whole practice might be a problem if the skill is too difficult or dangerous. So we've talked about lots of these advantages and disadvantages when we talked about methods of practice um, just before this, this pandemic occurred. Um, learning could be slower if the performer doesn't understand what to do and therefore they might lose motivation. And finally, they might not have any past experiences to draw on. So, 
task, little mini task. Can you identify what classification of skill this theory would be useful for and which ones it would be ineffective for? So think of all the different classifications of skill. Open, close, self pace, externally paced, gross, fine. All those different classifications of skill we looked at before the lockdown and decide would this theory of learning be useful around those different types of skill? Final theory, and again, touch upon this is just to go in addition with the work we've already done. So looking at observational or social learning theory, which is the one that we've spoken about most in different areas around personality, around lots of aggression, around lots of different topic areas throughout the course. So this social learning approach theory was developed by Bandura, as you know, um, who also constructed four processes that underpin successful modeling for more effective use of this theory. It's based on watching and copying behavior and social interactions from significant others. So we've talked a lot about this theory in different settings. The four processes, which we haven't talked about so much, which mean that observational learning or social learning is gonna take place. Uh, first one, attention. The performer must be paying attention to the demonstration. Second one, retention. The performer must be able to remember the demonstration. Third one, motor reproduction. The performer must be physically and mentally able to carry out the skill being demonstrated. So if someone demonstrates something to you and you're well, I physically can't do that, then that's obviously not going to lead to social learning. And finally, motivation. The performer needs to want to carry out the skill, needs to be motivated and want to carry it out. And we've looked at as well previously significant others. Um, so we're more likely to carry out observational social learning if it's we're, we're watching or observing significant people, people that we respect or admire or actually mean something to us. So these are people who are role models to us, they're important to us, and therefore we're more likely to pay attention to them and copy their behaviour. Um, and we need this for the theory to be effective. So what factors might affect successful modelling to you? Can you do, pause the video again and do a little mind map, what, um, what you think might be some of the things that can make modelling more successful? Um, so pause it, have a go, and then I'm going to put up some of mine, or on the next uh, bit below it's going to show some possible examples you may have come up with. So hopefully you came up with things similar to these. If the model is the same or similar to you in terms of age, gender, sport, position, attitude, culture, more likely to copy them, to be able to relate to that person. If the model is significant or powerful or someone we look up to, if the model's behaviour is reinforced or praised, rewarded, we've talked about this a lot before when we've talked about social learning. If the demonstration is high, uh, of a high standard, consistent, accurate and successful. If the model uses relevant behaviour, or, or socially acceptable behavior, we're more likely to copy. If the model is friendly or attractive, if the demonstration is clear and or repeated, if the observer is focused on the relevant cues and can remember what they have seen, so perhaps using mental, re mental rehearsal, we've talked about these different mental rehearsal and imagery previously in different areas. Um, and if the observer is motivated, you need to be motivated, you need to want to learn, want to be able to improve and do better. So, thinking of what we've said about the four processes, Bandura's four processes, again, just a, a little mini task in addition to the work you're doing on Everlearner. Can you match Bandura's four processes to each of the practical examples below? Oh, sorry. So, the first one I've put the answer up for you already. If a coach is shown a netball player how to shoot, the player must watch the demonstration carefully in order to be able to copy it. So, that's attention. Are they paying attention to what's going on? Second one, the learner must be able to remember the stages of the triple jump in order to be able to repeat it. So out of those four processes, which ones do you think it is? Have a little pause while you're thinking. And hopefully you came up with attention. The next one, a learner must be physically able to perform the gymnastics tumbling routine in order to be able to replicate it. Which of those four processes does that fall under? Again, pause if necessary and hopefully you came up with motor reproduction. More attention may be paid to a county footballer 
doing a demonstration of shooting rather than just a fellow school player? Which of those four areas? Attention. Um, a learner must want to practice the rugby tackle in order for them to be motivated to learn how to do it. Hopefully you came up with motivation. The coach will highlight the cues and the player must listen carefully in order to be able to copy it. Hopefully you came up with attention. And finally, the table tennis coach could repeat the serve several times in order to help the learner remember the key points. And hopefully you came up with attention. So this PowerPoint was just a little um, summary of the three different learning theories that we've been looking at elsewhere, just to go alongside the work we've already done. If necessary, you can make some notes on this PowerPoint to go in your folder and help. Uh, and then you can use this to take the, the final test, the end of topic tests that we're doing online. Stay safe. Hope you're all well. Thank you.